Hello once again, and welcome back to the TetraCast. This is RPG Site's weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. We're back to the core four this week. So my name is Brian Vitali, and let me introduce our familiar guests. We have Adam Vitali. Core four. I like that. Core four. Is that what, it, that what you heard? Core oh, okay. four. Uh, we have James Galizio. Hey, folks. And Josh Torres. This was supposed to be George's episode, dude. This was supposed to be like his, like the phoenix rising from the ashes. Like you guys doubted him, and here we are with the. We all know the final Smash DLC character. This was supposed to be his episode. Well, yeah, I think so- what happened. I think what happened is uh, Sora was announced, and then George exploded. So, <laughs> is that the canonical? That's what really happened. Oh, well, yeah. Well, Always so some, somehow him, last I mean, week we got we on a tangent. Previous... Somehow last week All we right. got on a tangent about what if Sora was the last Smash character when we were supposed to be talking about triangle strategy. I think, and then I like, <laughs> I like poo pooed on that. I'm like, guys, can we get on topic? And then look who's eating crow. It's me. And yeah. look who gets the day off. It's George. Yeah. But yeah, good thing uh, as we've previously established, uh, George is a robot, so we can rebuild him. That's true. Maybe he'll be up and running by next week, and then he'll be like, "Ah, yes, I am. I happen to be a competitive Smash player now." Like, oh, George, no, George, no, you need to get an Ethernet adapter first. <laughs> well, yeah, he is uh, in also in the process of moving soon, so maybe we can make sure that he has that on the top of his list once he's ready to. That's uh, true, actually. You're actually good- right. Uh, as for the the real reason he's out is that he's just out of town. So we hope to see him back next week, where we will endlessly rib him for any other reason that we can find, as we typically do. Square Enix's crimes on the Switch. Yes. Uh, so last week we had a a big packed episode full of everything out of Tokyo Game Show. Um, this week is a bit more quiet. It's kind of standard as we go into the big holiday releases. We'll probably spend more time talking about games are coming out and less time about news and topical announcements as we start to think about wrapping up our final opinions and our top 10 lists and our game games of the year. As we start to round out what released this year, what we still have time to get to, what we still have to keep time open for as other games release in these uh, winter months. So that's going to be the focus of this podcast alongside the few announcements that were made. There was one game last week that we didn't have time to quite quite squeeze in that adam had just finished and had also wrote a review for up on the site um and i guess i'll just let him take it away for that since we made sure that we earmarked this spot for you for this week so adam tell us about your time with ender lilies yeah so uh last month i spent i was playing through fantasian right which is a really long game kind of surprisingly long and after that, I was, you know, like, you know what, I'm, I, I'm interested in Ender Lilies, and this is kind of a nice shorter game. Um, now, what Ender Lilies is, I guess I should say the full title of this game is Ender Lilies: Quietus of the Nights, and this actually released a few months ago, I believe, in mid June, and it's, uh, it's a Metroidvania style game. Sorry if you don't like the term Metroidvania. That's just the easiest way to describe it. You, you know, exploratory action. Yeah, According search action. Uh, side-scroller RPG with exploration elements. So, you know, you go from room to room. um, uh, You get into various upgrades as you play through the game that unlock new paths. You know, there's pickups and uh, upgrades to find. There is an RPG element to it with levels and stats and whatnot. But, so when this game was first being uh, kind of announced, um, it's it's from an indie Chinese studio. Uh, I actually forget what they're called. The publisher is Binary Haze. But I, the, the studio is just sort of a, a small little uh, like Chinese Wire studio. Ad Globe. Yeah, Ad Globe, that's what it is. Um, and the, you know, when it was first coming out, I was like, oh, this kind of looked kind of neat. I like the I like the art style, um, you know, but I wasn't like that eager to try it or interested in, interested in it. But I had noticed that it was reviewing really well. Like, it's Metascore right now is an 86 and you don't get that very often meta scores that high just just for example that's higher than tales of arise 
um, I believe, which I think is at 85, which also better reviewed very well. Than, all right. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm not trying to say that definitively. Yeah, just, yeah. It's reviewing really well. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, whoa, that's sort of unexpected for this, you know, kind of out of nowhere indie game to be like, to get this sort of reception. Like, you know what? Let me try it. And uh, 10 hours later, I think the game took me about 10, maybe 12 hours or so. Uh, I I kind of agree with the high reception. I really, really like this game. It's um, so the premise is, is that you wake up in a ruined kind of fallen kingdom of sorts. You're woken up by this deathless knight. He's sort of like an undead, never dying, nameless knight. And he asks you, uh, do you know what befell this land or what fate befell this land? And you play as a young girl named Lily. And that's basically the opening of the story is that you're woken by a knight, you're in a fallen kingdom, something happened, and you go explore. And one thing that's immediately obvious uh, as you step into this game is that it has a very certain tone to it. It's a very kind of, it's a quiet game, it's a very melancholic game, very somber the the the, uh, the soundtrack to it is mostly like piano. It's kind of a mournful sort of uh, soundtrack to it, and this persists throughout the entire game. It's I find it actually kind of calm and relaxing. Sort of, uh, it's almost it's it's it has this style to it that I think just kind of really captured me. But I can totally see that maybe some people might not gel with that. But it's. It's kind of a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Poignant. Give me a second. Yeah, I guess. Um, let, let, let you pull out your thesaurus. Well, it's like hauntingly beautiful in a way. That's, I guess that's the way I, I'd put it. Um, so as you go and uh, play through this game, you learn about what happens to this kingdom. And the comparison I can make to it is kind of, is actually Valkyrie Profile. So as you explore, you'll meet people who have been uh, affected by a curse known as the Blight. And the Blight is this phenomenon that re that reaches this kingdom that basically turns people into monsters. And you learn, as Lily, that you have the power to purify people, to basically allow them to rest in peace. And you find, you find these people who... Uh, basically are they were regular ordinary human beings at one point just living in this kingdom you know a cleric or, or a, a knight or a warrior um or a priestess's guardian and they are now these uh grotesque monstrous bosses that you fight and once you defeat them you get a sort of memory scene of their life and these are very similar if you remember the uh, casual mode video we did about a year ago these are very similar to those Valkyrie profile vignettes where you just kind of get a little glimpse of their life. But unfortunately, the ending to all of these is always sad because of what happened to the kingdom. There is no happy ending. But it's it's kind of this sort of uh, tragic in nature but beautiful in presence sort of storytelling where you hear about these relationships between these regular, character, regular characters in this kingdom. You learn about what happened. You learn more about Lily's past and who this person is that woke you up. And one thing that really surprised me about this game is that the English localization is really good. It's very poetic in places. It's very elegant. And like some of these memory scenes almost made me cry. Um, I think I might even be tearing up a little bit right now. It's, it's, is, it's like, is it voice it's, acted? No, it's not. And if this was voice acted, it would be ruined. Um, any language. It's just something about the music... Um, the way that the words come onto the screen. Uh, like, imagine if uh, you had, like, the Thousand Years of Dream stuff, and if that was voice acted, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> so, uh, it, like, it's not voice acted, but um, it's very beautiful. The way that the story comes together is also really, really cool. It's not like a front-to-back exposition. Some guy tells you, here's what happened first, here's what happened second, or whatever. Um, it is one of those sorts of storylines where you kind of piece together various components of the lore through these memory scenes from these bosses through these, uh, when you pick up various items, 
uh, Dark Souls ish, if you will, in terms of like you get lore through the items that you pick up. Um, you also find these notes throughout the world. And at first, when I kind of realized that this is what it was going for, I was like, eh, I'm not so interested in uh, reading through these notes and journal entries and diary entries to figure out what happens. But they're, the writing is good enough and these clips are brief enough that they that I was actually found myself interested in reading more about it in terms of figuring out what happened, learning about the different places that you kind of explore in the world and things like that. So I, 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 had actually found it, I actually found myself engaged by how it was telling its story and I wanted to find that next piece of lore, that next, you know, story that was out there. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of got this style and the storytelling to it that, uh, you don't see. I mean, it's not. I, I, I was going to say incredibly novel, played, but it's really nice. Go ahead. Have you played Hollow Knight? No. All right. Um, so I would like you, Hollow Knight. Yeah, it's basically what I was getting at. So the way you're describing this, uh, I don't think Hollow Knight is maybe not quite as somber, but it has several of the same, like the the image and the emotion that you're evoking in your recount of your experience with Ender Lilies. I'm like, yeah, you should you should consider Hollow Knight if you like Ender Lilies that much. Now, my next question is sort of related. Uh, how long did it take you? Like, is this like a a ten hour Metroidvania? Pardon I, me, or is it uh, more longer, like a like an RPG? Hollow Knight is supposed to be really long, right? Right. That's 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 where I'm leading with this question. Is that Hollow Knight yeah, is very me, long me, for its genre? Let me check what Steam says. I was thinking ten to twelve, but it might be slightly longer than that. Uh... 14.6 and that's with all achievements so that's what steam says for me um, all right so that's pretty normal 100 percent metrovania length i guess probably yeah um you know you can probably beat it much quicker than that if you don't collect everything but i did now the one component to this game that is its weakest element unfortunately is its combat it's not bad it's just sort of serviceable i think it's good enough to carry everything else this game offers. But if you're looking for like an energetic, really compelling, like action RPG side scroller gameplay, that's not what this game has. Like that's not its strength. Um, I think it's good enough, but it, I get, how it works is that, so you, you're woken up by this knight. He's named the Umbral Knight. Well, it's not his name. That's just what you call him. Um, and he ends up basically, so Lily cannot fight for herself. Uh, she's just like an eight-year-old girl or whatever. But um, sh she basically has this knight fight for him, and he ends up being, being your basic three-hit combo. And then as you go through the game and you fight these other people, you gain their abilities. Like, for example, one of the very first people you fight is a a priestess's guardian, and they wield a, a ball and chain. And so when you defeat them you gain their ball and chain ability. And what it is, is you basically press a button on the controller and you'll summon this spirit momentarily. They'll swing the ball and chain around, around, around them and around Lily and that they'll, you know, do damage in a circle around you. You then you, when you fight a, a mage character, you gain their sort of spell slinging ability for a ranged attack. There's a bow ability. There's a claw ability. There's actually like 30 of these to be honest. Um, so there's quite a bit of variety. I sort of found uh, myself, once I kind of had like a suite of four or five abilities that worked for me, at that point I stopped experimenting. Like, I'm just going to stick with this because it works well. Even if I get new abilities, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to change what's working well. And, you know, it's okay. It's, it's just not the strong suit of the game. I actually do know, uh, I do have an acquaintance who didn't really like the combat at all, and it kind of ruined the game for them, even though they liked everything else. So it, it, that's just kind of the one thing where it's just like, sure, this is not the strength. Um, based on the, the number of abilities though, that you said, before you get to exploration, based on the number of abilities that you said and the time it took you to be, it sounds like you keep uh, like unlocking those at a pretty brisk pace. Yeah, you do. There's There's like eight... Uh, major bosses in the game that each give you ability, but then there's, you know, 20 or whatever mini bosses that you fight too, which are kind of like, they're, they're really just like souped up regular enemies um, that you fight throughout the game. And, um, but anyways, for the exploration, it's actually very, it's a very lenient game in a way. It's not very hard um, if you're familiar with these sorts of styles of games. It's like side-scroller-ish. There's, you know, a little bit of a, 
you know, a, there's no stamina, but there's a there's a bit of a you know, find the enemy tells and know when to attack and when to not attack and things like that. The exploration in this game though is ra- rather lenient. You when you enter a room on your map, and your map is kind of the typical you know Metroidvania Castlevania sort of map where it's just a bunch of rectangles that show you um, how they connect to how the rooms connect to each other and the various paths between them. But also, it's if the room on your map is highlighted blue, that means you still have a secret to find in that room, and if it's highlighted yellow, that means you're done. And these maps, the maps throughout the game, will actually tell you which where the exits are to each room. So that makes when you get a new ability, that makes backtracking uh, very convenient because you sort of know you can just see at a glance which rooms have secrets left in them, which rooms have exits that I haven't gotten to yet, and you know where to go to look. It doesn't tell you like precisely, oh, you need the double jump here or whatever, but. Um, it still makes it very convenient to backtrack. You're not just kind of randomly just scouring the whole world again. You're like, oh, here's a room that I, I've been, I was at, you know, an hour ago, but I didn't get everything there. So let me re- let me revisit that room. The 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 warp system in the game, to the different checkpoints, is pretty lenient. So um, it kind of removes a lot of the tedium there. Do you, and you have that, when, and you have that unlocked from the start. Like you don't have to pick up something that's like a radar correct. or whatever. Okay, because I know yeah. some games like often more and more. I'm thinking yeah, like Metroid games. Ori. Yeah, well, I was thinking the Ori games. I'm trying to remember oh. exactly. Like you can't right away see where all the upgrades you missed are, but eventually by the end of the game, the, it throws you a bone. You're like, all right, now you have the ability to go back and get what you missed. But this one just goes a step further and just says you have that ability. Like it's built into the UI or the UX. Yeah. So like seriously, if you if once you get a new ability, you just like click your map and you're like, okay, I see all these blue rooms that I was at, you know, minutes or hours ago. Let me just kind of hop, trail along these rooms and see if I can find anything again. Also, if you happen to die, you don't you just basically respawn at the previous checkpoint while you keep like the items and the EXP that you got before you died. So it basically just sort of pushes you back to the checkpoint, which is you know, it's, it's like the 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 most minimal. Uh, loss of progress that you could possibly have it just pushes you back and you got to make your way back to the boss again or whatever so it's it's actually kind of a very lenient game to play which uh for me after playing through fantasia which we have talked about is the especially later parts in that game is uh gets pretty intense with some of those boss battles uh it was i actually found it kind of relaxing and nice in that way where you just um just it's easy to explore. It's easy to backtrack. If you happen to die, it's no big deal. But yeah, the bosses in this game are also they're not they're not super intense or anything like that. You, what I what I ran into most of the time was like the first time I'd fight a boss. Sometimes I'd win. Sometimes I'd lose. And you you know that first time you go at them, you, you kind of realize, oh, here's the attacks they do. Here's what you want to watch out for. And then most of the time, the second time I was able to defeat them. So not a super intense game or anything like that. Um, but otherwise, overall, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I do think Ender Lilies is sort of the type of game you kind of have to be in the mood for to play it because it's not a high energy, you know, upbeat sort of game. But uh, it is one that I do think will like leave a lasting impression on me. It sounds like the way you're describing it, that it kind of has like the trappings of an oppressive you know, because you talk about how it's in like a ruined kingdom and all these grotesque monsters, which might make you think of some of these other like more challenging games. But then you say it's really forgiving. It's really convenient. It's really relaxing in a way. So, well, yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's it's not like brutal. And it's you're you're right. It's it just kind of it's, it's not going to be like a high energy, you know, up pace sort of game. But Otherwise, uh, check it out. It's on, I think, every major platform. So, And you did write up a review on it, which, based on the way you're describing it now, it seems like you would have been very, very positive on. So you think, likely, as I said at the top, that uh, we're getting to the point where we have to start at least thinking about end-of-the-year stuff. You think this is going to be present on the list? Uh, I will push for it. I don't think anyone else has played it. I know, I know actually Chow has played it, but I don't think he ever finished. Wait, what? Does um, Chow not count? Oh, he never finished. Yeah. 
but um, it'll probably it's, it's it's probably like in my top th- my personal top three for the year. But you know, if no top one else three. Has I, was, it. I was expecting well, you to say like top five or ten, maybe, but you say three. Jeez. Yeah, top three. Um, All right, then I guess I'm going to have to buy it right now. I'll get around to it, hopefully. I, I'd like to, but I, I definitely am, am in that kind of like, man, I have a really beloved like indie small title that I'm really the only one who's played it. <laughs> I think I think Holland did too, but yeah. Which one is that are you alluding to? Uh, Nozia. All right. Man, be... this has been a really good year for uh, smaller titles because like, we haven't talked about it too much, but like I did a review for um, Death Store, and that was really yeah. good too. So. Mm-hmm. And we talked about uh, Unsighted last week, which, by the way, there's also yeah, and Fuga. Uh, I was gonna say the Unsighted got. The, I don't remember if it was up at the recording last week, but it also has a review up on the site now. Uh, so yeah, a strong year for indies. We'll probably end up with a couple on the top ten, maybe. We'll see. So another, uh, I don't know, like out of tactfully <laughs> say it, say, say this, it, but uh, another, so another, one. An, uh, another game in this genre also released mm-hmm. recently that a few of us <laughs> have been playing. Well, what's the name of the genre? Uh, I don't know. I don't want to get yelled at. It's, Give me it's a more action. <laughs> Well, ten. I know. I know. Some people get really upset if you call a Metroid game a Metroidvania well, because that's it doesn't have the Vania that, elements. That was, that was my. Um, that was that was the non-negotiable. I couldn't let that word escape my mouth. So now you said it. People can get mad at you. Tar and tar. And well, no, here's, no. Here's the thing. You can't call a Metroid game a Metroidvania because the Vania elements are the RPG elements, and Metroid doesn't have those. I've, I've definitely seen some comments around the web this week that have called Metroid a Metroidvania. <laughs> So so what do we there, do? There, like, there is a fun there is a fun uh there is a fun tweet about this guy. He's like, I would have black out any part or anybody who calls a Metroid or calls Metroid Dread a Metroidvania with a black marker. And he literally is like has a funny tweet where he's like marking like the Nintendo a black marker. Or, he's marking a black marker on his computer monitor. <laughs> uh because he can, I guess. <laughs> so so what do, what do we do when they do add RPG elements? Then is it a well, lot or does this, it just become obvious? That, then this, I'm I'm being partially serious here, where the Vania part of Metroidvania is the RPG elements. But, right. but what if here the Metroid the part is the exploration sort of? Uh, so a Metroid game doesn't have typically the Vania parts of it. But what if? But what I'm, if I'm it does? What if it serious. does? What 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 if yeah. a Metroid game introduces RPG elements? Does that mean we can just drop the Vania part going forward? And then they're all just no. And Nintendo calls it an exploratory <laughs> action. If it has the RPG, it'd be an exploratory action RPG. All right. So Nintendo let's stop belaboring the point. Uh, Metroid Dread obviously released uh, recently, and I know that both uh, James and Josh have been playing it. I think both of them have made significant progress, or maybe even finished. I'm not sure. So I'm going to pick one of you out of a hat. Uh, James, tell me about uh, your experience. I... Hmm? Did I make the wrong uh... choice? No, no, I actually did finish it. So, yeah. All righty. Uh, well, I picked you randomly, coin flip. So, and I know that Josh is also making progress through it. But tell me about your experience with Metroid Dread. Obviously, you have been playing through the series recently in preparation for this. So, you have, I don't know, you, you have the floor. It's the best Metroid game. Ooh, oh, out of the gate. Bad. Damn. He played, have you played, played Prime? Prime? Yeah, no, no, it's the best sort of 2D count. Metroid game. I, <laughs> oh, I feel like the lines get back. kind of. I feel like the lines get kind of muddy when you're like comparing 2D and 3D uh, games from the same like uh, series. Yeah, like, I feel the same way about Zelda. I was I was being a little bit jokey there. Yeah, but at least as far as 2D Metroids are concerned, it's the best Metroid game. It's definitely the best playing one. Like it's definitely the best control, like like control feeling of the series. I don't I don't agree with a lot of the like the the, the button or the control mapping in that game, but um, it definitely is the most snappy and responsive one out of the two D uh, Metroid games. It feels really good to control. I just wish there was more like options for like button remapping, essentially, or like making like your missiles like toggle or hold, you know, for example. But I, I can see where they're coming from, but it's like, but I, yeah, but I, I agree so far from where I'm at. I'm like at about, I don't know how far I am. I don't want to know how far I am, but right now I'm like at a certain area where I like, I revisited this like wildlife area after visiting a certain area and like things have gone awry and things are getting uh, crazy. 
and but I've been enjoying it so far. I don't know how many how much how many hours I've spent so far, but um, I, I can see why people would say that it's the best Metroid game uh, right now, though. Yeah, so I finished it. Uh, like the one complaint I've seen people have consistent. Well, there's a few complaints. Some people aren't a huge fan of the Emmy mechanic, which is kind of like building upon the ideas from Metroid Fusion with the kind of like stealth segments. Though I wouldn't even say the Emmy stuff is necessarily stealth because I guess to, 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 to kind of set up like what what the what the Emmy are in this game. Basically, like the premise of Metroid Dread is uh, Samus is investigating this planet because the Federation um, sent out these like security robots. To go investigate, like they, they notice there's like an X parasite on this planet. Like, oh, let's go send our like security robots there. And then, uh, you know, no, no surprise, they didn't hear back from them because, you know, things ha- things have gone bad over there, and the robots have been taken over. So these like six or seven like robots are now like on the hunt for Samus, and like they're like in designated zones. It's not like a nemesis mechanic where it's throughout the whole game. It's like designated zones throughout the map. Where they like chase you around if they spot Samus in them. Go, go on, James. I just wanted to establish that for people who don't know. But yeah, so I really like the sections because I feel like a lot of people have fallen into the trap where it's like they feel like they absolutely cannot be spotted. They absolutely need to make sure they make it through a room without alerting an Emmy where. The way it feels like it's designed is, yes, try and avoid them, but there's some situations where it's best to just try and juke them and, like, like, kind of run past them, because otherwise you're going to be spending way too much time waiting around. It's a, a pace breaker. And the thing that really kind of stands out to me is that even when you do get caught, you have two chances that very, very small windows to parry their uh, insta-kill attack. But even if they do kill you, the way the game works is that it'll automatically respawn you right outside of the Emmy zones. And um, the way that the Emmy zones are spread out is that there's always, there's always an exit out of them relatively close by. Like it's, they're kind of like in the center of each map that you go on to. So it feels like not only are you going in and out of them a lot until you finally get the uh, Omega cannon, which allows you to take them out. But It feels like a just a really good change of pace, like in between, like um, doing um, specific things, getting specific power ups, because it's like, okay, Especially for like optimizing like your route, it's really interesting realizing that like certain things that you might want to avoid doing in the Emmy zones or certain things where it's like, okay, yeah, he might spot me, but. It's actually faster if I just kind of ignore the fact that he saw me so, um stuff like that yeah so I, I, I like these emmy zones too i like i like the whole like improvising during a chase sequence i, I don't mind if i get caught uh like uh, I, I like being chased by them because it makes me like have to improvise my route on the fly and think about okay how am i gonna uh what which zone am i gonna use to like juke around them and then make my escape so like the, those fun, those aspects of it are like really fun for me like i, I don't know how other pe- people felt about them but like for me it's like that's a that's a really cool refreshing change of space uh pace that kind of evolves from fusion's like horror-esque uh like atmosphere so it's a it's an interesting way to like uh design them because unlike some of the other zones these uh parts are more open uh to give you uh, give you more like options to like route around them yeah, not to mention that with the exception of like one or two Emmys that have a kind of ranged attack, like unlike SAX, where SAX, like as soon as it spots you, you basically got to hightail it because if it hits you even a couple of times, you're basically dead because of the way the Emmy works and that you're really not taking damage until it's right on you. And even then you have a chance to get out of it if you're good enough at like hitting the timings. It feels a lot less frustrating being spotted because you know that it doesn't mean instant death. It just means you need to get out of dodge. And a lot of that comes down to knowing the environments and the Emmy zones and knowing which ways you can go that will kind of create space between you and the Emmy so you can get out of the alert zone so you can escape. I think uh, the uh, outside of the Emmys, I think the... The really funny thing that I wasn't expecting from this, because I really haven't really kept up with the marketing or anything with this game, but like when I first started it and like I got the few hours in, uh, like they really tease you 
with like uh, the like the morph ball areas because you don't start with the morph ball, but you're just like but you keep passing these zones that like I could make it up. I had this morph ball, but it's just not here. And like you don't you don't get the morph ball for quite quite a bit on like other Metroids. So it's like wow, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> they really tantalize you with those areas. But yeah, it's uh, actually it's okay. really cool how like I think the idea of having some of these like integral. Um, metroid abilities and upgrades come way later in dread than in previous games you they do some really interesting stuff with the environments like the new slide ability perfect implementation perfect implementation specifically because there are many like passageways where you can slide through an opening and then you pop out the other side but you don't have the morph ball yet so you can't go back the way you came and a lot of people have i've seen have been like complaining about how linear dread feels but the funny thing is, is that, like, uh, just as time has gone on and more and more people played the game, we've realized that, no, there is a lot of sequence breaking you can do. It's just you really have to go out of your way to find it. Like, there's this one boss fight, which it was already in the trailer, so I feel like I can talk about, it, like, Kraid. Um Spoiler! There is... <laughs> no. There's a morph ball launcher in his boss arena that you wouldn't find... Unless you already had the morph ball bombs, which normally you do not get before you fight Kraid. But if you sequence break to get the grapple beam and the bombs before then, you can actually enter in that uh, morph ball launcher and it's one, a one hit kill. So, oh, they so, even... they, so they actually accounted for that, like in the design yes. of the game. That's that yes. is cool. So it's like you see all these people say, no, this feels too linear. And I just look at the Kraid thing and some other instances and it's like, no. You, you just uh, you, you just haven't figured out how to do sequence breaks yet. And and that, yeah, that's, that's, now. It's also just a brand new game. Like those things will come like as like you know more people explore and like kind of tinker. That's what out I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. So like it's not like uh, Super Metroid and Fusion sequence breaks were like like found in a day or anything. Most of the advanced ones. So like I, I'm interested. I'm really interested to see like you know how where the speed running community uh, takes this game because you know Metroid games are always fun to see how. how how wide open people can break them in terms of, yeah. of, of that aspect. But yeah, like it, uh, you know, this really, it follows up in that, like the design philosophy of fusion where like, you know, your first casual playthrough, like with most Metroids, like it'll be a linear playthrough because I'm like, you're trying to, you're exploring the game. You're learning the game first. I'm like, okay, what are, what's the intended route? What, what are the, like, what's the sequence of upgrades? Am I gonna, am I getting in this game? And then like from there, once you have more info about the game, you can start thinking, okay, how can I really, you know, find it, uh, find things in a way that are only crucial to to, to proceed? And I'm interested to see what uh, that all, um, how that'll manifest. But you know, overall, I'm I'm really, you know, I'm really glad that like I stayed a little bit on blackout for this game because I, every time I like visit a new area, I'm like, whoa, this is like a really cool area, like a really cool biome that like this sent uh, this sent me to. Um, that like some some will have like temperature mechanics like oh I can't enter this area yet because it's either too hot or too cold, and just you know I'm just kind of making my way like just having a great time. I think um, like I was uh, mentioning earlier, I think some of like the the control mapping is a little bit busy. Like grapple beams, for example, like the to grapple beam you basically need to hold down like uh the I'm gonna use PlayStation uh, button terms because it's easiest. Like you have to hold down L1 for the free aim, and then you have to hold down R2 to change your beam into a grapple, and then you fire it off with like the I think the circle or the square button. Um, it's the square button. Yeah, and then and then and then like there will be times where you have to swing from one grapple point to the next, and then like you have to like let go and then get all your fingers on those buttons again to for the next grapple point. It's it's like it takes us a bit of like. Uh, you know, you get used to it uh, over time, but it's like one of those. It's like I wish there was just like a little bit of options that let just let me toggle whether to hold or toggle or hold like a certain action. You know, yeah. to, to one thing. Requirements. Yeah, one thing that Sam's Returns had is that as soon as you get the grapple beam, as long as your like beam uh, trail is like looking over a grapple spot, it will automatically shoot a grapple beam. I think I know why they didn't do it in this one, because you have the grapple walls, which also can be hit with the grapple beam. Yeah. And there's like way more of them in the game. 
So it would probably be really annoying if you're trying to shoot an enemy that's in front of a grapple wall just to accidentally grapple onto the wall would, when you didn't want to. Yeah, so that's probably why they didn't adopt that from Sam's Returns, which makes sense. And then let's see, I, I the, for the most part, the performance I'm, I'm playing it on a on a Switch. Some other people have d- done more other non-Switch means. Just you know, it's fine. Um, so like, it's okay. Healthy. You it, you can say that it like emulators aren't illegal. You can say that people are emulating it. <laughs> I, I'm just saying some people have been playing it through non-Switch means, but um. Yeah, like I've been playing on a Switch. Uh, it's been held 60 FPS for the most part. There have been some weird frame drops during gameplay here and there that, like, it kind of like freezes like for like a split second and like back up again. Those are a little bit annoying, but they're not that. It's not that often. Um, I think like the one thing that's obviously glaringly obvious is like as you're taking like uh, phasing into like the next zone area, it does take like maybe like maybe 20, 25 second loadings, and it's like it's done in like in a weird ninety CRPG way where you just see like a like a, a still frame of like Samus, but it's like it's like but the environment is moving around her, so it's like it's like a railway or something. You'll like see like the lights like flickering like you know in the background or overhead depending on where the lighting source is and it's kind of like it it rem- gives you like a weird 90 crpg era vibe like planescape or something <laughs> it's like all right i guess that's definitely a choice how frequent are those um not so frequent like i mean it's only like when you're going into like a new like zone so let's say biome, like uh, yeah. yeah let's say i'm going from like uh, biome aim to which has like a forest to like biome b which has like a snowy area these are all made up by the way um like it's just like when you're traveling between them that that's what it takes but like the stages in in those biomes like like you know they they load pretty much instantly the, the last major like question that i have as someone who wants to get to this eventually now that my personal life is freed up for it is um story because in Metroid Prime, I don't know about Simmons Returns, but in Metroid Prime 3 and then obviously Metroid Other M, the the series, at least from that front, I know those are um, 3D games. Well, Other M's kind of like two and a half. Uh, that they started getting more and more chatty, more and more dialogue heavy and cutscene heavy. Uh, how does Dread feel compared to that? It does have as... cutscenes, like for sure. Like there'll be times where like you go into a zone and like, something happens like say like a boss shows up or so like or like um, an event might happen it, it to me because i haven't played a metroid in a while so i don't know how it is cause, like i don't have the my memory isn't as fresh as uh james here but to me it feels like it's more cutscene heavy and dialogue heavy than what i remember from like past metroid games but i agree, like uh, yeah do you agree with that james because you have like yeah the, the, i i'll say that there's definitely more dialogue and cutscenes in this one than the previous uh, 2d games but it's not a huge deal because in your first playthrough it's not like it's a complete and total pace breaker and obviously if you're replaying it you're just going to skip those anyways so i think it's kind of a non-issue yeah right. you could easily skip that was just like uh press the plus button and it'll say hey you can press minus to skip it's like all right skip so i don't yeah, it shouldn't be that bad. I just know that, you know, when people say, like, why, why why, do people take to this series so well? It's because it's like the sense of isolation and quiet and loneliness or, or things like that. Um, and I didn't feel that with more recent games. Now, a lot of my I have played Super Metroid a long time ago, and I don't remember it that well. So that's why my first point of comparison was Prime 3 and other M, because I haven't played like Fusion. Um it's it's weird talking about the series because we only see one every five years or so, and I and I skip Samus Returns. So like five I talk years. About... This is the first new two D Metroid game in in t- over twenty years. Well, I I was doing um all the whole series, which maybe not be which is another like caveat. It's like it's almost like two series under the same banner. Uh, but yeah, um, the generally it's we see these series once in a and we see these entries once in a blue moon and I skipped the most recent one. So I have to pull back from like a decade ago. Uh, we we are a stuff um, from my personal experience and my memory of Super Metroid is I, I basically should replay that at some point because it's been so long that I don't have I just don't, like I just have vague vague recollection of what the art looked like. And that was pretty much it. Um, so that's well, why I asked the question about game. Super Metroid yeah, all-time is. classic. 
I would totally play Samus Returns if they released it on uh on Switch. But it does feel good fi- it finally coming back to like a pro- like a proper like home console environment. Like it does feel really nice. Like the, the everything just feels so snappy and smooth uh controlling it. Any other final thoughts on uh Metroid Dread? Um, I'll, I'll probably finish it soon. It, it feels like I'm like in the final stretch. I have no idea though. It, it somewhat feels like it. Um, but so far I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm glad that, you know, this, th- there were, there have been, uh, quite a few instances where Metroid has gone wrong and I'm glad this isn't one of them. <laughs> and it does feel kind of interesting that we're, that we obviously, we talk about more than RPGs on this podcast, even though our je- definition of RPG is admittedly broad, but you know, this this is the sort of game that kind of ticks a lot of those same boxes, but it, it obviously will not be showing up like on our site listing. But obviously, it's, it seems like you guys are both enjoying it enough. And the, and the series does have a pretty good pedigree that I'm totally happy to like earmark a spot for it here on this podcast, even though it's a little bit uh, out of scope for us. So mm-hmm. it was enjoying to hear you guys talk about it. I mean, we also talk about the. It's nice. To, it's nice to talk about a non RPG that it's also not a fighting game. I guess. I'm Are you saying a, we I'm talk not, about fighting games too much? It's our yes. second most prevalent, like, genre is a weird word. Like genre, what's what's like a, what's like what's above genre? I don't know. Um, category. <laughs> I don't know. Something, something like that. Though I do remember, like, way back, the like we we did. I remember uh, when George was on uh back when he like first started right. we were talking about doom a lot all right so pulling it back more towards uh traditional rpg coverage uh these are games that have we have talked about on the podcast before but we just wanted to like revisit briefly just to get some new perspectives on them uh we did talk about how adam wrote up a pc port impressions piece about Neo, The World Ends With You, as it released on the Epic Game Store a few weeks back. And at the time, he had only put in a few hours into it and basically just said, I like how the game runs and that's really swell. Uh, but now that you've had more time to get really far into it or maybe completed it, I'm not sure, uh, just figured we might as well just allow ourselves to you know, revisit Neo, The World Ends With You from your perspective, Adam, and tell us what you think of it as a, someone who is a big fan of the original game. Yeah, so I am on the final day of the third week, and I'm sort of doing some wrap-up of stuff before I, like, beat it. So I'm pretty close to the end, although I know or I expect there to be a pretty significant post-game as well, because the first uh, The World Ends With You had one as well. But uh, so I really like this game's characters, and I really like its combat. One thing I really want to highlight is I think the localization for this game is fantastic. Uh, every character in this game, uh, you know, they're a bit cartoony, you know, but the, everyone speaks uh, with a character voice that is very unique to them. And it's just so consistent sorry to interrupt, throughout the game. When you, say, when you say cartoony, you don't mean like visually. You just you mean more like their personalities. Well, the, well and visually. personalities, but also visually. You know, it's just that, that, that style of game, right? But like right. every character has a very consistent character voice throughout the game and everybody speaks differently. And it's it, there's a little bit of catchphrasey stuff in there, like for example, with Mina, Mina Miyamoto's or whatever his name is, uh, math stuff that he does. But it's the sort of game where um, if you were to remove the character portraits, remove the voice acting, remove the character name, and just look at the dialogue itself, you 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 could tell who's talking, because everyone speaks very uniquely um, for uh, <laughs> that kind of fits their personality. And it's really well done. And like I said, it's more than just gimmicky, catchphrasey stuff. Like, for example, Nagi, she is sort of a... Uh, she kind of reminds me of, like, a Lord of the Rings nerd, where she speaks very formally, and she's like, onward, and things like that. She says, uh, you know, uh, and she always... Instead of using it's, she uses tis. Uh, is more of a, like, a tis a fraught situation we find ourselves in, or whatever. Stuff mm. like that. Um, and, uh, Fred is a little bit more, um, kind of casual. Uh, Rindo is very, is kind of sarcastic in ways where he's like, uh, all right, this doesn't make sense. Uh, other characters I can't mention because of spoilers, uh, have their own unique ways of talking, but even like Shoka is an important character in the game. She's kind of, uh, she's kind of, uh, how would you describe her? She's very, uh, 
she's very terse and in how she speaks and she throws insults a lot and kind of feels like she's pissed off all the time and she speaks like that and it's it's really well done i think whereas maybe in a weaker localization that character voice wouldn't come through and everyone would just kind of sound the same right so i think it's really well done uh throughout the game and this has been mentioned in many of the reviews including cullen's but the combat does get it evolves quite a lot throughout the game as you get more characters and you get more psychs which are your abilities throughout the game and it's it, it gets kind of hectic but really fun in the later portions of the game as well there are a few parts about this about neo that i'm a little bit more mixed on though this the sequel kind of really doubles down on these uh basically the non-combat gameplay in between the days each character in the game has a sort of a special ability that they do that uh like for example fret can do remind which is sort of a gimmick where he can uh you do a little puzzle and he'll remind people about things they forgot to progress the game or uh rindo the main character this isn't really a spoiler um he can travel back in time so you sort of they call it replay and you can kind of redo parts and change things up a bit to to meet a better situation or outcome and things like that, uh, and imprinting is in the game as well, which is also in the original, where you sort of just find a word and you sort of imprint it on a person's memory to kind of get them to say a certain thing or whatever. And I kind of feel like these parts of the gameplay are just not interesting. And I, I think it like it feels like the original game had some of this, but it kind of doubled down on it. And it's just kind of, I kind of find it just tedious. I don't know. Just... Like, it, whenever you go to a section where you realize you have to replay something, it's just kind of like, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. Like, oh, okay, I just got to redo this part, change a little thing here, maybe do an extra fight. Now I got to replay this part and do this part again and change a slight thing. And it just, I don't know. It just, it's not that interesting to me. It feels too guided. Like, I'm not, I feel like I'm just along for the ride. I'm not really doing anything. I'm just sort of clicking through stuff. It just it feels like a way to artificially enhance or lengthen the game in a way to me, especially when it just kind of comes up over and over again. I think the first game this it didn't bother me as much in the original game. I think because the original game is just much shorter overall, but this game is a lot longer and it's just kind of like eh, I don't know. Going back to your original topic about how the characters each have their own voice and how you said it feels not too gimmicky, like for what the when you described that, what my brain immediately went to this is a, a little bit of a tangent, but I think one of the worst um, applications of that is East Nine, the hieroglyph knight Chatelard, uh, how he like scores oh, his people. points thing. That's just yeah. like stuff like that. It's just like this is so dumb. Like this does not make me more endeared to this character or whatever. So when they find a way to like cleverly and believably introduce some sort of verbal tick or manner of speaking or something that you can identify the character's personality on that doesn't cross that line of being like, this is dumb. This is just stupid that th there's more skill involved in that. I think than maybe even I would give credit for it. Like we want to have something that is identifiable for this character, but is also still believable without making it so subtle that you don't notice it. So the fact that you say that mm -hmm. it's done really well here, I think is a testament to the localization. Like you said, I know that was, this is just a screen topic, but I was no, that's fine. That. But that, that, that's actually like one of the things about the game that I think is a highlight to me. Um, but the other thing about the game that I'm kind of just not I'm a little bit more mixed on. The original The World Ends With You had a very clear theme, almost like a message about what it was trying to say and about like what the game is about. This game, I feel like it doesn't quite have one. It's mostly just wrapped up in mysteries and under mysteries in terms of like what's going on? What, what, what are these people doing? What is, you know, and it's just the original game, by the end of the first week, you kind of already can see like, oh, this is what the game is about and what it's trying to tell you. And the, the best, the shortest way I could put it uh, the game title, The World Ends With You, is almost like the theme of the game itself. Where the second game, I just kind of feel like it's not nearly as thematically interesting or as strong. And I'm at the very end of the game, so I, you know, it's, I doubt it's going to show up now. But it's just, it, it, it kind of boils down to like friendship again. You know, it's just like, okay, this isn't, sure, again, friendship. We've seen that before. And it's just, it's just not as interesting the second time around. I 
I think that uh, Rindo is a very, very good character. And I think that he is a legitimately good choice for a follow-up to uh, Neku. Uh, I do think, though, that I actually think that Fret could have been the MC on his own as well. Mm -hmm. I think I think his character arc would have been fitting for the actual protagonist as well. I'm not sure if you feel the same way. Yeah, I, like I said, I do like the characters actually quite a lot uh, in this game. Uh, how do I put this? Uh, I actually, I wasn't too big of a, I'm going to make a Tales of Arise comparison here. I wasn't too big on the characters in Tales of Arise. They're okay. But I kind of feel like in games like that, they spend a lot of time just being mouthpieces for exposition. Just kind of saying like, here's what's happening and here's what we're thinking and here's, you know, what's going on and what we're going to do. Whereas I feel like in The World Ends With You, this game has a lot of dialogue and it gives the characters a chance to be characters more so, I think, in my opinion. And um, even if it's not like directly relevant to the plot or what's happening in front of them or whatever. And I really like the characters in this game. Fret does have a bit of a sort of like, it's kind of a sidelined backstory that kind of just appears which maybe if they put a little bit more focus on that, I get what you're saying where he'd be like, maybe they should have like focused on that and maybe made that his character or made that like more of a centralized focus here rather than just sort of pushed to the side. But I do think the characters are great. I just think in terms of like overall themes, it's just kind of like more standard and typical for a Japanese RPG than the original game, which had a very clear, unique, unique uh, new novel theme. Which, you know, if this is the second time around, maybe that's just not unexpected. But it's just, you know, it's just like not... I, I think it's missing just a little bit there. So I also think, though, that Rindo's whole character is kind of a bit more nuanced than uh, Neku. Like, Neku, like, you can kind of understand what his problem is, what his whole deal is, just by kind of, like, looking at him. But Rendo's stuff is more subtle, and I and I think he is a really good character, and I can understand why some people prefer him. It's just unfortunate that because of the type of character he is, it's kind of harder to get across, and it's not going to resonate with everyone. I was going to ask you, Adam, so if you had to pick between the two games, which one would you put above the other? As a game itself, the second game is, like, if you ignore story character writing... As a game itself, um, like mechanically, the second game I think is, uh, it's not as unique with like the touchscreen controls or whatever, but I, I think it is pretty strong. It's, re it's really just those kind of like in between combat sections that I'm not too hot on. I just feel like you don't really, it, I feel like it almost barely qualifies as gameplay. You're not like doing anything uh, except just kind of following the prompts. And, but otherwise, the combat itself is really good. And I like this with the RPG elements in terms of how you set up your pins and your clothing and how the food works and all of that. So that's really good. I like that a lot. Um, it's hard. To, it's hard for me to say like if you only picked one because the second game is definitely a sequel. Like if you don't play the first one, you do. I think are going to be not totally lost, but there's going to be things that are just kind of go straight over your head. So. So it sounds like you said the second game is your answer, even though you did it like stated so clearly. I didn't want to give an answer. It's, I, it's I, hard. I, I, I like know. the second I'm, game, I'm but it's hard to, to say. Like me. it's hard to say. Like play this one for sure if you but, don't but, play the first. I mean, this seems obvious, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. But you think it's a worthy sequel? Yes. Right. I'm just you know yeah. just because I'm mixed on a few things doesn't mean I don't I dislike the game. It's just kind of like I wish this was stronger or maybe they trim down a bit in between in, during these like daytime puzzle things that they do. But otherwise, I'm pretty happy with it. What I heard is Adam doesn't believe in the power of friendship. Yeah, <laughs> Adam doesn't enjoy that. Another game that we talked about on the podcast, actually just last week a lot, it was the, the main topic of our podcast last week, was Kuro no Kiseki, which obviously released in Japan. We'll be waiting a long time for it here in the West. Uh, we had a slot here just to follow up on some future thoughts the the further that james gets into that game or, or josh gets into uh his experience with the game the less we can kind of talk about it yeah. but i know there was a few few things that you just kind of wanted to wrap up on before we put it on the back burner and wait for the localization um so i finished chapter two i'm about like a little under halfway through chapter three so i think that means i'm reaching the halfway mark not quite there yet uh 
I can't really talk about story stuff. I think this is going to be a hot take, but um, if the game sticks the landing, this has a real good shot at being potentially my favorite game in the series. So that's you so, twice today saying best Metroid game, best Kaseki game. So it sounds like you've had a really good month <laughs> in terms of video games. Yep. Um, I don't know how Josh feels about it because you just, well, you watched someone else play. But... Yeah, I watched, I watched my friend play, but it was like, it was, I watched it for 80 plus hours from yeah. beginning to end on it. Uh, while, you know, we were live translating for friends in that call as well, uh, who just, you know, um, yeah, I stayed up till I. Th- he got done around Monday earlier this week. I stayed up about four a.m. <laughs> as he was finishing it. Um, he finished it. And he was like, "Oh yeah, I got like work in an hour. I guess I'm not sleeping." <laughs> like, yeah, I guess I'll try to get like four hours of sleep, maybe. Um, yeah, it's a uh, man. I was I'm really impressed with the game overall. Um, I think. It's, one thing it, I can talk about that yeah, I go. think both of us, both of us had this like worry before the game came out when we saw that Van and Agnes were like the two main characters. And it's like, oh, Van's 24, Agnes is 16. Kind of uncomfortable here, Falcom. I'm shocked that they made the relationship work. It's, yeah. It's like, it's literally, I don't know the best way to describe it, but basically the way it works is, is that Agnes is the one that really gets the story into motion. Van isn't like persuading her to do anything. He is literally just saying, look, I've told you, I, d- I think this is too dangerous for you and I don't want you to get involved. But if you're really going to get yourself involved regardless, then yeah, I'll support you. But and like at the end of every chapter so far, he's like, are you sure you still want to keep like dealing with this? Because people have been getting hurt. This is getting serious. I can't guarantee your safety. And their relationship is way more respectful than I think, especially after Cold Steel 4, that I than I expected Falcom to be capable of handling. It's probably, I, I would say it's probably the best, like, hero-heroine relationship uh, that series has ever seen when you think about Estelle and Joshua, Lloyd and Ellie, uh, and Reen and whoever. Whoever. <laughs> yeah. Whoever you want to be a mayor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, like... It's and it really speaks a lot to Van's character because the way that Van treats Agnes isn't unique to how he treats Agnes, but all of the party members that eventually join Spriggan, he treats them the same way. Like there's always these little instances where Van knows what's up. He knows the answer, but he gives all of his like new hires like not an opportunity to say, Hey, what do you think about this situation? What do you think, so? You and know what this a, reminds me of? This yeah. might Josh would have to uh, chime in on this. It's not it's not quite the same, especially the Agnes character, but it reminds me of Tales of Vesperia, Yuri and Estelle, mm-hmm. where uh, Yuri, the way that Yuri was described is that like he's already had his character arc like before the game. So he's sort of like a fully established character who, like James just said, kind of knows what, who he is and what he's doing. But Estelle does not. And she, Estelle doesn't seem to have, like, the same sort of, you know, story impetus that Agnes does, based on what you said. But she is sort of like, I want to explore the world. I want to see what's going on outside my castle. And Yuri is kind of just tagging along, like, um, you know, so, sort of similar to just what you said. But uh, when you said, like, how Van kind of knows what's up and he kind of asks for the opinions of the other characters and things like that, Yuri does that quite a lot in his game. Specifically, I'm thinking with Carol. Um, yeah, in that, yeah. so it kind of reminds me of a similar sort of relationship to there. That yeah, I obviously I haven't played it. I'm just going by what you said. What do you think, Josh? You're thinking uh, you're thinking along the right lines, uh, but the the way that uh, Van, the the Van and Agnes relationship is that they're a lot more uh, story involved. Like uh, mm-hmm. Van isn't a done character. There's definitely uh, the game does explore his character. Uh, quite a bit, and in a, in a way that I actually really fa- found uh, uh, pretty refreshing when you compare the other protagonists. Um, like he has but- flaws, and it's under the surface, and you can see them. But it's not like he's completely like 
He's not like Reen, where Reen barely has any idea of what he wants to do with his life. Fan knows what he wants to do. He just has those problems under the surface that you're eventually going to have to deal with. And it's it's a much better balance, I feel like. Yeah, I, I, Magnus is really cool because she's she's a very determined, confident woman. Like, she knows what she wants as well, and she's she's damn willing to go forward and uh, and try to, like, you know, find the truth about... Well, like her own like character arc and like yeah. what like in finding like the out the mystery of these like mysterious Genesis devices because you know that's pa- like part of her legacy almost like in her in yeah. her family and also that, like mm-hmm. she's Go not for. like powerless like you can tell that for as much as she says oh that she's like she even before the game outright tells you this and I haven't even gotten to the point where the game drops the bomb but. <laughs> Whether fortunately or unfortunately, since I just played Hajimari before Kuro, a specific character's voice in a phone call was enough to let me know a very, very important thing about Agnes's uh, family. And it's like, oh, that explains a lot. Yeah, and then the, the, yeah, this game, this game will will definitely like you know if, if you're if you're savvy enough with the series, it'll you know, you'll pick up on on hints of foreshadowing. And like it's just it's just like when I was like done with that with that game along with my friend we were just like we we're just so impressed uh with, with how this uh first like game in the arc i think it, it's probably the strongest first game in an arc like e- even compared to zero and okaseki which like that was a really impressive outing for that too but i think in this even more so when you think about like the get like the legacy that it's had to like kind of uh, like not, not i wouldn't say redeem but like kind of carry on in, in, in a more bet in a better direction and I like just like as the end credits were rolling, I was like, "This, this really hit me in a way I didn't think it would." Uh, and you know, I, I'm I, I think so it's fucking it's sorry, also, Western fans. It's, <laughs> it's, so it's fucking also sorry. it's also one of those games that like it, we know a sequel is coming. We know more games are coming, which will probably more tie back in heavily with the series. But if you just want like a what it done type of like uh, trails experience. Like I think, like similar to Zero and the Kaseki, I think this would be like a like you know a fine way to like just like hey, what are these trails games about? Let me go try one of them. Like go try out this game. It's fine as like as like a uh, as an experience that like a, a newcomer experience where like you don't really miss out too much on like you know what the main story is trying to tell, and it ends in a way that's like okay, I'm fine with like you know just you know having the experience. It was a pleasant one, and like I'm okay with like not maybe playing any future games because this is like a really cool game like if you just want a one and done experience with the trails series i think this is an okay one to like do do that with and i think that's really impressive in of itself too and i can't See? stop like like listening to like the soundtrack this game i can't wait for the original like the official release of the original soundtrack i've been like listening to like the the mini soundtrack and the bgm race because there's so many good tracks in this game i love yeah. the piano tracks so much yeah, I feel like a lot of people have been getting angry at the soundtrack, and it's like, well, there's some songs that people absolutely hate, and it's like, in context, like, in the actual game, it's like, no, this is actually, like, really, really good. Yeah, it's sick how they implement them. But... So, James, when you said that this is now potentially your favorite game, depending on whether it sticks to landing, what is what holds that position currently? Uh, the third. And my... It's good for me. For me, it's either third or zero. Um, so the fact that you say that, and I know that our opinions are very similar aligned. I, I know you're a few games ahead of me now at this point, but yeah, makes me very hopeful for this game once I finally see it. Uh, see you in 2031 or, or whatever. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd have to really think about it like if the, this way. But I, I could, it's definitely like in my top three trails games for sure i don't know if it, i don't know if that's a first second or third yet i have to think about are you it. actually gonna play it at some point or are you just oh, gonna yeah play? yeah no i'm just no, gonna no. watch it <laughs> <laughs> no when the pc version I'm, comes out I, I, i'll play it you know <laughs> i'm, I'm the sort of person that if you've watched the game for 80 hours like i still yeah tr- like, I, I still trust your opinion like 99 is percent as much as i would if you played it and even 99 I especially feel like if it's like still... especially if you're being very interactive with the person playing it right yeah you know so, so yeah, there's one of I those. I mean, like, like I wanted this is like, kind of dumb. <laughs> this is kind of dumb. But Brian and I are twins, and when we were young, there were plenty of games that he played and I watched, and vice versa. You know, just <laughs> and I kind of consider that as me having played it. Yeah, because we were right there. Yeah. So. 
So a couple of the features that have gone up on the site, we've talked about uh, Adam's two reviews for Unsighted, the indie game that we talked about last week, as well as Ender Lilies, the game we talked about at the header of this podcast. Um, also, we talked about last week the demo, or is it the last week or the week before, the new demo for the uh, Yoko Taro helm title, Voice of Cards, The Isle Dragon Roars. This is that card-based RPG where the cards are more of a theming than like a mechanic. Uh, but Paige actually wrote up a impressions piece on her opinion of the demo. So she liked it and it's up on the site. If you want to read her full impressions about that. And the title is a card game in appearance only. So kind of hammering home the point that the card is more of an aesthetic than a design thing. Well, I mean like a gameplay design thing. So read yeah. up her full. Impressions. That, that seems to be an overwhelming, uh, kind of what came out of the demo is like, this is, plays very traditionally like an rpg like a traditional yeah. classic rpg just with a card it is it is interesting to, to see it. with like it 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 did like at at first glance for like some people it's like it rang like alarm bells like oh no it's another card game i don't like card games i'm staying away from it it's just like an automatic response and then we also have a new kind of feature up on the site. And this is something that Adam does every year for the last several years. Uh, he collated and gathered together a list of all of the RPGs that are slated to come out next year in 2022. And again, we actually kind of talked about this topic. We cast a very wide net. There are several games on there that basically, if they're RPG or RPG tangential, we put them on the list. Of course, in the first iteration of this, this is the RPGs of 2022 uh, feature up on the site. The, you know, when we first, when Adam first puts these together, the, the amount of details that we have are obviously very little. So some of these are just undated or dated in a very vague, very vague window. Though we do have a few things, obviously, about quarter one, all those release dates that we've gone over the last several weeks, talking about how impact quarter one seemingly always is going into the next, uh, any next year. Um, so. We've got the Monster Hunter Rise PC, Elden Ring. We've already got a date for Starfield in the back half of the year. Uh, so, Adam, I don't know if you have any other further comments on when you put this list together about, uh, you know, anything. In I started putting this list together. I forget why, but according to the system, I started putting this list together in January 2021. Uh, so I just published it now, but I already have a 2023 list going as well. Um, these are, yeah, this is a thing I work on pretty much every day. Do, do we have uh, so, any uh, sneak peek behind the scenes? What are the hot RPGs of 2020 through 23? I don't care about 22. I, I can literally pull this up right now if you want. If you want, do it. Do yeah. it. I, I'm interested to know like what Trails of Reverie. You have a... <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so the 2023 games I have are A Rise of Awakener, Aiden Chronicles, Project Relic. Oh, uh, Aiden Chronicles. Uh, Trail yeah, the 2023. The Iron Chronicles uh, 100 Heroes. Rising is uh, 2022. Uh, and then the three Trails games, not uh, Owl and Reverie and the spinoff, are all 2023. That's I forgot. I I'm so, I'm so, why didn't you call <laughs> right. it? Isn't it called Azure in English? Or wait, what's or it called? Whatever. English? I forget what it is. It's zero and then something else. It's, it's, something it's, else. Uh, it's a so work in progress. not published, published yet. All so, right. <laughs> <laughs> but no thank you so much for that and i do know that we reference it a lot and uh, other people might also find it useful so that is up on the site and we uh, he updates that pretty much weekly so thank you for all the hard work that you do on that it pays dividends in many ways all right and now we're going into the topical section which i kind of you know preempted at the top of the header and said there's not a ton here especially compared to coming off of uh Tokyo Game Show streams and news and announcements and release dates. Uh, but there are some uh, big hitters here, especially here at the top. So we got an update about basically a new company structure for Rio Ga Go Rio RGG Studios. Josh, help me up here. <laughs> Rio Ga Go Toku. Yeah. So this obviously is the studio behind the Yakuza series and also Fist of the North Star and a few other things. Um, Rumors have been swirling around for a while that we don't we didn't try to like entertain until we knew from the horse's mouth. Well, here it is. They've talked about organizational changes, most notably that uh, Nagoshi is departing the the studio. So and there's a few other tidbits in here, like they explicitly talk about working on a sequel 
to Yakuza Like a Dragon. They talk about some of the other names and what positions they're taking. So uh, I guess when it's I not think official, of the... It's not official where Negoshi is going. Like They haven't like outright said it, but the I believe it was Bloomberg reported that it's NetEase that we talked about on a, pro- on a podcast previously as where he's going to do a, a new studio to work on console games for NetEase. Although that's not... It's been reported. I don't think it's been stated in any f- official manner yet. Right. So we reported on the official press release from RGG Studio. And then in addition to that, there are third party reports. So just mm-hmm. just to, because I want to highlight them here, taking up the reins as the head of the studio is Masayoshi Yokoyama, who has basically been a, a lead writer for the Yakuza series for a while. So based on uh, at least based on Like a Dragon, I think that is you know, in good hands. They also talk about um, some other people that are taking up positions at the you know executive level for RGG Studios, um, and then some a message from Yokoyama, the new studio head, as well as from Nagoshi as he departs. So we've got all those messages up on the site. Um, feels like the series is in good hands. It's exciting to know concretely that they are working on a follow up to Like a Dragon. So. Yeah, this is, you know, a really, really big change for RGG Studio, you know, uh, Toshiro and Nagoshi and Daisuke Sato were, you know, were pretty much there from the very beginning. Uh, and, you know, to see that, you know, that the the new generation come up and, you know, take over, like, you know, fra- fresh new beliefs uh, about carrying on, you know, uh, lessons learned from the previous uh, heads will, you know, it'll, it'll do the series wonders. It's a, it's. Now is a good time to do this, especially where they're at in the series, you know, with Kasuga taking over as the main character and people like Like a Dragon. A lot of people really liked Like a Dragon, even though they weren't like into the Yakuza series, you know, beforehand. Like that was a nice like like reboot of like, you know, where the series was heading. And a lot of people, including me, really dug the change to turn based RPG. And, you know, and th- not to say that like their other series are slacking, you know, Lost Judgment, I really had high praise for what the, what they did with Lost Judgment, and, you know, that's, if that's the direction they want to go, I'm all for it. I'm all for seeing what RGG Studio can make uh, just with new talent and heads behind it. You know, I think it's a really exciting prospect. Uh, best of luck to where Negoshi and Sato are heading next, you know, and, yeah, this is, this is uh, to me, nothing but, like, good news. Like, this is just I wanted to see, you know, more new things coming out of RGG Studio. They kind of had this, like, weird slump when they were going from, like, the 3, 4, 5 era of, like, okay, I can see where they're going, but it's kind of it's kind of more of the same, but you're getting too bloated uh, with a lot of spots. And, you know, I, I'm always up for RGG Studio trying new things and not relying on the past to, like, carry them through. And, you know, hopefully this means that, like, they won't only just, like, have their eyes focused on the Yakuza series and spinoffs. Hopefully they, like, make a new binary domain or something or try something else entirely. That'd be, I'm all up for that, too. I'm I'm most curious to see RGG Studio when they try something completely new outside of the, the boundaries of a new Yakuza or Judgment or whatever. Now, I have a question because I'm late to the Yakuza series. I started playing them when they released on PC, so, like, 2000. 17 18 and when that when i read in this report that rgg studios is only 10 years old that kind of surprises me because obviously the the series itself is older than that like the yeah series, i mean yeah yeah because they were all like developed internally in sega at sega and then they branched off at some point while like you know taking the core staff that has been working on these games so uh like you know the rgg like the rgg studio label ha- hasn't wasn't there at like the original ps2 release of like the yakuza 1 and 2 games but at some point like they're saying you know we keep on making these games they're successful we usually have the same core staff working at them why don't we just since it's this franchise has been so that, yeah. successful, you know again and again why don't we just branch them off to their own thing and you know rgg studio isn't like beholden to that like for the recent virtual virtual fighter uh release you know they they worked uh on that game as well the next topic is something that came across when we talked about Sora coming to Smash. Uh, it's really interesting that that is not something that we would normally cover. Like we might tweet about it because obviously it's an RPG character coming to Smash, which is a game we don't really cover. But alongside that announcement, it was also announced 
to several people's delight, maybe, that the Kingdom Hearts series was coming to Switch. Uh, as streaming entries, which we've seen before from some other games. This is an interesting yeah. one because I actually have a younger brother who, and I'm sure there's like a pretty large population of people that are like this, where they are very into Smash. And whenever a character is announced from a series they don't know, they immediately go and buy that and start playing it. And I've seen actually a few like, funny images or memes or jokes on social media where people are playing kingdom hearts one and getting like tripped up by some of the early bosses like the trick master or the or the hey trick master the, is pretty tricky or the uh the chameleon name. in uh in tarzan land he's it, also it's, tricky yeah it's it's weird though because like i remember struggling on those but i'm also like i was 10 uh so yeah. on, on these people people that i presume are older still struggling on those but uh yeah it's interesting that we have the whole series uh is is it the whole series you gotta be careful when i use like yes. when i use like yeah. absolute well, terms like that it's the 1.5 plus 2.5 bundle the 2.8 bundle and then kingdom hearts 3 and dlc bundle so basically, so basically so, the same yeah. stuff that got released to pc uh, early in the yes. year well, so. except not. I don't think they announced Melody of Memory. Well, that's already on Switch. Never mind. Yeah, right, right. I think the um, only game on Switch that's not a cloud version, I guess. <laughs> oh, the only thing that like separates these releases from the PC to the Switch release is like the the PC version does have like an all in one bundle, while um, the Switch does for this oh, one. Yeah, you can buy you can buy like a package that's just everything. So how much? I, how I much just, is that? I don't think they've said they haven't. They uh, didn't uh, give like a date or anything. They just said it's coming. Yeah, but keep in mind, like you know, like uh, Brian already said, these are all cloud versions. You're not running them natively from the Switch hardware. This is all reliant on like how well your internet connection can stream these games to you. This is kind of like the Stadia equivalent of the uh, you kinda, know. This it's kind of weird though. With like, especially this is like the obvious statement, but like the first two games are PS2 games that were remastered for PS3 and then ported to PS4. Like you can't run those on Switch. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's the, that's the thing that kind of like ticks me off uh, on this because I can understand if it was like it was like two point eight and then three and DLC. Like I can understand yeah. there's no versions just for them running on the Switch. Okay, I get it. But like for the all the other fucking old games, really? Like this? Like this isn't like I'm sure there is a path to make them work with the Switch's hardware. I just don't think Square Enix is willing to uh, devote the resources and time to do it. So they're like. What's the quickest way we can do this for the Switch and the one that'll like make the most money? And it's like, well, people are definitely going to get this, like no matter what, probably. Which is and and it sucks because these are the kinds of games where you need to have like a reliable like your inputs matter in these games. These are like yeah. pretty high energy action RPGs, and some of the boss fights in them are very very like busy and with like you need like some good reaction times to get through them like just like the sephiroth like arena fight alone you know you need to have like some good reaction times for that so if you're playing that in an environment with shoddy internet you know um it's not gonna go well and that that sucks you know and that's the only way you can have that experience on switch that's ridiculous i mean three i think we all would understand but the first two are interesting choices i remember yeah. like i haven't I, mean, I pulled up a list just because i was curious that uh, Japan had a significant higher number of cloud streaming games uh, compared to the West for a long time. And, you know, actually, it's still the case, like Fantasy Star and um, uh, Resident West. Evil and Assassin's Creed. And then I, mean, I, I, me. hmm? I forgot about PSO2 being a cloud only on Switch. But then I thought about it, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember playing that once. <laughs> like, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remind me, is Dragon Quest X on Switch as a cloud version too? Uh, no, I've got a game card, so I think oh, it's actually okay. native. But like, even yeah, in the West cloud now, we've got, uh, <laughs> we've got Hit, we've got Hitman, and we've got Plague Tale and Control. So the list is growing even here in the West. Like in Japan, you might argue that because of their lifestyle and their like portables outsell consoles there, you can see it. But it's interesting that it must be successful for those publishers to start doing it more often worldwide. Um, so it'll be interesting to see I, I, that, yeah. how it turns and out. Obviously, the internet structure here and there is different too. Like the, the the one saving grace of those things is like I I think it's for all of them, if not most of them. Like at least have they have demos out to like test your internet connection. Yeah. Say hey, like is are you is your current environment can can you handle this like game for it or is the experience like you know acceptable for you or not? So at least there are ways to like 
you know, test that out. For, I, I think it's for like all of them, if not most of them. I don't know if they do it here, but they should, at the very least, should have demos out for these Kingdom Hearts releases on Switch just to test them out and see if it can like handle it on your, you know, on the user's end. If if they don't do that, then like that's that's insane. But you know, at the at the flip side, everyone like the logical conclusion that everyone made that would satisfy to the most people. You know, Sora is the final Smash DLC character, and of course, you know, the part of the caveat for that is like no Disney characters can they cannot show oh, up. Right. Can, so you know, they had like all like you know the dive to the heart backgrounds. You know, everyone is like, "Oh, here's Ixion with whoever, and uh, here's Sora, uh, Riku with showing Sora and Kyrie with his uh, one." But but it's Sora, you know, it it Sora is inseparable from Donald and Goofy. But for this one, it's like, "Oh, here's a boat and a star with Sora." It's like cool, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, there's obviously the a lot of very very hard discussions. Had to be made behind the scenes to make Square Enix and Disney happy with uh, Sora showing up there. And one of them I was do like part. how the the last edition, like the 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 copyright tag for for Smash uh-huh. Brothers, was already crazy, but now it's got Disney on it. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I know a lot of people were also upset that this does. It's it feels people were comparing it to the cloud and uh, entry, obviously, because another Square property. But in terms of no remixes for the yeah. soundtrack so the only, and the only thing they got to rearrange was like the victory uh theme when you win a battle with sora that's the only rearrange really yeah does does it have simple and clean no I, I, I just I, I read that i'm like that can't be right because i used that in the in the trailer for it but the, I the, most the most you'll get is um like a, i think if you have like a melody of memory save data on switch you'll get like a rearrange for like a, a track from there or whatever uh, um, I, don't, I don't think it has simple and clean from what I remember. Um, which is, you know, that's that's the that's the sacrifices you have to make to get Sora into Smash. This is the yeah, reality. Yeah, all the all the all the red tape that you got to navigate through to, to make it work. Uh, yeah, if they if they're planning to like like this, this is probably one of those things that like this is the most friendly to like port this game forward into like other Nintendo future Nintendo uh, consoles and releases, right? Like if they if like. I can't imagine a new Smash is coming anytime soon. So the mo- the easiest thing to do is to support like Smash Ultimate and all of its DLC forward as like a, maybe a bundle or something, and like it'll look better and maybe run oh, better. One thing I do want to say is that I think it's possible that the main reason they were even able to justify licensing Sora was the idea that oh well we're only gonna have to license him for this one game. Maybe that too, you know. Um. So yeah, I mean, it uh, you know, with all the corporate corporate realities aside, like seeing that like CG cinematic of like you know finally unveiling Sora first with a keyblade and like the the weird zoom in shot of the Disney uh, Mickey Mouse keychain on the keyblade saying "We did it, bitch!" You know, <laughs> and finally unlocking Sora. You know that like that 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 is like a legitimate like magical moment there. It's like you that you guys did it. You guys fucking got him. Do we think this is a uh, a worthy final character? I think it is. I think I think, I it think, is. I think if there was anything that was the objective right choice for the final Smash DLC character, Sora was it. Yeah, it, like if it wasn't Sora, it would it would have been like Sakurai himself. You know, that's the, those are the <laughs> only two things that like would make the most people happy. I, like I would have been in the camp that like if, Sa- if Sakurai put himself into Smash, that'd have been fucking baller. But you know, Sora is okay. I'm trying to think if it wasn't Sora, who would be like the next most worthy? Uh, Waluigi. <laughs> yes. Um, this, might be, this, well. this might be a bit silly, but I was thinking like maybe like Master Chief because you finally get like the trio of the of the console manufacturers, even though I know that's very yeah, Western centric. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Master Chief would have worked. Master Hand would have worked. Um, Sandbagged. <laughs> hell yeah yeah i was kind of i was kind of hoping for like more weird dlc characters like piranha plant you know just out of fucking nowhere it's like hey we got piranha plants like all right i guess sure i, I saw some people <laughs> like ranking 
what they thought was their favorite and least favorite. And I saw so many people digging at Piranha Plant. I'm like, to me, that's just like, that's clever, creative, and different. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I like having that they have spots for silly additions like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just funny that, like, the, 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 it's sort of funny that like the D DLC me costumes became that like weird play playground of like, well, we really couldn't get them into this game, so here's like a me costume for them. <laughs> so just like it's a good indicator of like who's coming next and who isn't coming next. Yeah. Uh, so we feel some people were crushed when Lloyd from uh, Tales of Symphonia was really good in <laughs> yeah. costume. Yep. Um, so I mean, that's the end of an era for Smash Ultimate. There, there'll be never, there, there will never be a game like Smash Ultimate ever again in terms of like game collaborations and IPs right. coming together. It's like, if, if anything, that game is like just like a an interesting monumental moment for like video games of like just how far are you willing to go? Just make everyone like play nice and shake hands. You know? <laughs> that's crazy. This next news bit is a, a heavy one for, in multiple ways, and that is a death of a prominent gaming industry figure. So the, the Dragon Quest composer Koichi Sugiyama passed away on September 30th with the cause of death being septic shock. So obviously a titan in the industry for his contributions there, but also you know a conscientious figure uh, not conscientious, contentious figure for his views on several things in terms of LGBT rights, uh, suicide rates, the Nanjing massacre, and things like that. So this was something that Alex Donaldson appropriately wrote up the news story for to try to give this bit the proper context that it deserves, both recognizing uh, Sugiyama's obviously iconic contributions to what made the Dragon Quest series what it is today and the musical tracks that people identify with that series, but also making yeah. sure that the everything else that goes along with what he supported financially with those, you know, earnings is identified and given proper context so just to sort of leave it he was one of the most important figures in the at least our part of the industry it's just a shame that and there really is no better way to put it that he was such a gigantic piece of shit yeah yeah, yeah. he was also the composer of a hit video games such as jesus and jesus 2 so <laughs> yeah. uh, really great games but um you know that's that's life you know and hopefully you know the dragon quest series is better for it like un unfortunately you know he had to be he had like he held like such disgusting beliefs and views on like just create like it's crazy to me still like how can how can you hold these views but it's just you know moving we have to all move forward now hopefully you know dragon quest is now in a better place for it like detached from them it's always it was always difficult for like dragon quest fans who were in the know to say you know i really like dragon quest i love like you know the old school rpg feeling it still gives and it, it's always it always sucks for those people like you know that always has has had to go like you know but you know the one thing i really dislike about it is like you know obviously the composer of the series because of you know the long list of things that just like sugiyama believed in so it it is definitely it sucks and also we can move forward for the better uh you know and and so. certain people are more capable and willing than others to separate art from the artists and totally valid if you you know totally just want to recognize him for only his contributions to the dragon quest series in the gaming industry and only in that mindset that's fine but we want to just give the proper context uh, as, you know, his beliefs and his views on life and how certain people and populations are affected by those beliefs. Yeah, I would go as far as to say is don't feel ashamed for feeling relieved that he is no longer around to spread his hate. Yeah, it's it is in a way a sigh of relief here because he, he was a bad guy and he was tangled up in stuff that people loved. So that untangling is honestly kind of good. <laughs> so. And it does sort of seem like that we already, when we talked about the Dragon Quest Twelve logo announcement and some of the uh, some of the statements by Hori about how there, it seems like it's kind of a real pivot point for the series in terms of theme, in terms of art, potentially based on the logo. And now, you know, ostensibly because 
what they decide to do for the soundtrack. So it'll kind of be an inflection point, and we'll it'll be interesting to see. And we're, we're still years away from that, but what what Dragon Quest Twelve carries forward from the series legacy, and what it establishes brand new. So uh, yeah, I, I, I really wonder like right now. what does like Dragon Twelve's music recording is nowhere near done at this point. It it can't be right. 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 So and like and you know they already they announced at the initial announcement obviously like you know Sugiyama would they did still be working with Sugiyama on it like are they still working with someone different now or they're gonna try to like reuse what Sugiyama has done like with <laughs> Eleven you know um, I'm interested to see like what 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 answer they come up with I'm hoping that you know they find a, a new main composer for Twelve like if you want this to be the, the the turning point for the series go all the way with it you know don't don't be so don't feel so attached. You know, to the legacy of Sugiyama and move forward. Uh, if you like, if you were to think of a, another composer to like, you know, carry up the Dragon Quest composer mantle, who would it be? Like, who would be like your choice to do it now? Yuzo Koshiro. Ooh, I like that. Who uh, is the com- uh, the composer of Octopath Traveler? Nishiki. Yes, Nori yeah, Nishiki. Nishiki. Yeah, Nishiki. That'd be an interesting one too. And then who? Who? Uh, that Dragon Quest Die game, not the mobile one, or there's still there's a couple yeah, of games. Yeah, Infinity yeah. Trash. Yeah, that yeah, one. Uh, that's uh, I think Haya- Yuki Hayashi. I think uh, I'd have to, I'd have to go do- double check. Infinity Trash. Uh, that's this one might be typical, might be difficult to find. Uh, yeah. The, um, music. Yeah. So yeah, for for the at least for the die the the new anime for the uh, adventure of die like the new uh, anime adaptation of that yuki ayashi is the one helming that i don't know who's also helming infinity trash but you know yuki ayashi a very very talented composer yeah um, but i remember some of the, some of the footage people, of that game i yeah, really most people music from ayashi's work from like he's the compo- a composer on the my hero academia series you know and people really like the ah. music of that um you know goes with everything goes with everything yeah yeah if he's if he's gonna be like the new main Dragon Quest composer, if that they were gonna go that direction, also a worthy you know follow up, so, you know, and you can you can probably t- there's a lot of fun stuff they could do with the Dragon Quest soundtrack from here on out, not beholden to Sugiyama's legacy. So interesting, yeah, you know that it it came at this time, and you know, uh, it, some people will go one way with it, so others will go another way with it. This. I'm very happy that you know that people will no longer have to like hurt because because of Sugiyama's, you know, financial benefit and, and profit. You know, they at least in, in that aspect they don't have to worry about him anymore. Thank God. Mm-hmm. On the same tact, we did get a release date for one of the other things that was announced at that Dragon Quest anniversary uh, event earlier in the year, um, Dragon Quest X Offline launches in Japan on February 26th for February 26th of next year for PS4, PS5, Switch and PC. So this is the game that had a very different art style taking the several years of development from Dragon Quest 10, their MMO that's also Japan only and creating an offline version of the game uh releasing next year. There when this was announced, people thought that maybe this would be the way that they would present that story and that game to a worldwide audience if maybe it was untenable to transfer the MMO over. Uh, but as of right now, even this online version of Dragon Quest X is still Japan only. So two different ways that we are not allowed to play yeah. <laughs> Dragon Quest X I, without yeah. playing. I mean, with, 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 this, with this theme release, I, I, I think, you know, it, maybe it'll be down the line. Uh, this will be, this, this seems more likely at least to get localized yeah. because of the Steam release. I'm sure it'll be localized eventually, since especially they said that if they were going to localize, it would have to be an offline version. So, hmm, I wonder why this got greenlit. Though, the thing that stands out to me is that they've already kind of revealed the pricing, and obviously the base game is full price, but they're still going to be selling the expansions as, like, DLC for this at full price as well. And with that being the case, I think... Once I finally get back to Final Fantasy XI, whenever that happens, and I finish up the everything there, I think I'll just use a VPN and play Dragon Quest X the regular way. 
Damn love, love not, not offline. Yeah. Not a bad right. idea. A couple of small announcements here. Uh, here's a sales update. Story of Seasons Pioneers of Olive Town has surpassed uh, 1 million units, including shipments and digital sales. So uh, has anyone here played this one? I, I feel like we talk about this game often, but the people who end up covering these games for our site don't are, often aren't on the podcast. But yeah, cool to I, see you. Yeah, I used to be a, a big, like, uh, well, no, I was not never a huge Harvest Moon fan or, like, I guess, Story of Seasons now. Uh, I played the GBA games and that was basically kind of it. And I was kind of interested in Pioneers of All Town, but it's just been so many games this year and <laughs> you got to just like decide like what to play. And I just never got around to it. Yeah, yeah this also, is the, the reception to this one wasn't great overall. So yeah, this year uh, feels like it's been more of like you got to pick and choose your own battles in terms of like what games you want to play. <laughs> now <laughs> there's been there's been a lot, so you know, it just kind of fell by the wayside. But yeah, it's at least even though even though we haven't had a chance to discuss it personally with our experience with it, uh, it did it was Xseed's fastest selling title they announced early this year, and now it's hit a million units. So at least it seems like this game has been a success. So people who are still big into Harvest Moon. And now Story of Seasons looks like that the series is, is still running strong. So that's obviously, of course, yeah. good to hear. Yeah, it seems like Marvelous is doing pretty well with stuff like uh, Sakuna last year being a surprise hit. Um, this is doing well. There's Rune Factory, which I, I that released in Japan, Rune Factory 5. I don't quite know how well it did there. I know Chow was a little bit uh, disappointed in its performance. It's coming out next year in the West. Uh, Hopefully they'll make a PC <laughs> version of Rune Factory. 5. Yeah, the, there's a, there's a PC version of Rune Factory Four coming out this year supposedly, but it hasn't been dated yet, as far as I know. So that's a good enough reason to not get Rune Factory Five for me on Switch if there's even a hint of like a chance. Yeah, because <laughs> it seems like that version <sighs> seems like performance is the big issue there. Uh, no Chow on the podcast today to talk about this, but we have a date for the next Genshin Impact update, the next major one. Uh, Genshin Impact 2.2 launches on October 13th in the middle of next week, and that adds the last island in the Inazuma region, uh, another new character, and basically the typical suite of stuff that you see in an update to this game. Uh, unfortunately, without Chow here, I don't think we're going to be able to go into much more detail than that. But I mean, the, 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 the platforms that haven't gotten Aloy yet because they, they weren't on a PlayStation version of the game, I think they, they'll, be, they'll be able to get Aloy now uh, in Genshin. So I guess that'll yeah. be like mobile and PC. Yeah, so... no, uh, Yeah, good catch. So if you played on PlayStation, you had access to Aloy, uh, but now if you're on a mobile or, or PC version of the game, you'll get, them with the two, get her with the 2.2 update. So I do know that Chow was saying that one of his main issues with the game was the lack of content earlier when when it was stuck doing like these weird mini game beach survival things before 2.0 but since then from an outsider's perspective it seems like they've been coming in pretty fast and frequent though i'm not in the like i i keep seeing headlines about how people are upset about certain characters because of how they mesh with the existing roster or how they mess with the game design and unfortunately i'm just not well versed enough to know exactly like why certain things become controversial in the yeah, it's, it's your typical gotcha game problems, right? Because like you want your new sparkly five star SSR character to be broken as hell because you know they it takes the, the the rates to get them are way lower. So you would hope that like once you finally get them, they like change up everything. They're super strong and whatnot. And like it had it had like a a similar problem way back when nearer to the launch. They had like this character Zhongli. You know, um, who like when he came out, like he was relatively underwhelming to some of the cast. Um, so like uh Behoyo went back and like really buffed up that element that like he represented. So like he became a really great character after enough complaining. So hopefully people are hoping like for a similar uh thing with like some of the newer characters, they become like awesome, uh, hopefully with enough complaining on top of like the other problems of like the game having its first anniversary and like the rewards for the first anniversary, you know, being not being as great as some people wanted them. So it's a lot of people's first like 
uh, time with this type of game. Um, so they wanted something amazing. And, you know, for some companies like Mihoyo, they're more conser- on the conservative side on that end of the spectrum. So it's kind of like a weird ongoing, like, you know, like vicious cycle almost. Yeah, I feel like every other month I see something where there's like a misalignment between expectations of the fans and what the devs are delivering, which depending on the specific circumstance of each of those instances, you fall on one side or the other. It's not always yeah. absolute in, in one court. It sounds like the more recent one is a five star character who was designed to be a healer. And people think that she is not like balanced appropriately to be a five star character. Um, so what we'll do instead of just gleaning the, the, the surface is that next time Chow is on, if he gets time to to dive into 2.2, we'll have his post impressions about what it added and his opinion on Maybe him. the winning play is to not play. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Or at, at some point, no one on the uh, comes to the cast will be playing anymore, and then we'll eventually just have to like wean away from Genshin Impact because we won't know what we're talking about. So Chow will have to bail us out next time he's on. Speaking speaking of Genshin Impact, Mihoyo did officially announce Honkai Star Rail. Oh yeah, it wasn't on our list. Um, it's so I don't know much about Honkai Impact Third. I think Josh knows more than me. I this is like I don't know if this is like a sequel or just sort of you know same universe spinoff, same characters but in a different world or whatever. But they do describe it as a they they describe it in one place as a strategy RPG and in one place as a turn based RPG. So I don't know if it's more turn based or more strategy. There is one screenshot that makes it look like more of a traditional turn based thing, but they basically, no date or anything like that, um, just a quick trailer. It's coming out for PC and mobile devices, so no PlayStation yet on this one, or consoles at all. No date, um, they're doing a beta test. Uh, it's got the same sort of art style, you know, anime aesthetic, really high production values, but it seems like the main difference here compared to Genshin, obviously being the more, their, more, their most popular uh, game, is that this will be a turn-based classic style game. Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly what its relation is to Honkai. I imagine like same world, same universe, maybe far flung into the future. Uh because when it, when it, my time my limited time with Honkai Impact, it was like a more grounded game, not really space related or focused. Um it had like a lot of flying uh, airships and stuff from what I remember. So I'm not exactly sure what the relation is to that. I don't remember much of the characters when I look at the characters, I'm like, I don't remember those characters that I played, so maybe an all new cast as well. Um, the one thing I did glean from this from the, with the announcement is like the promotional material now, I guess with Mihoyo going forward is to make it like look as uh, Genshin Impact as possible because when I was looking at the trailer I was like, oh, this looks like a Genshin Impact character trailer or something um, mm-hmm. the way they market it so, you know, ho- that, I guess they're going to try out that uh, style of marketing and hopefully, you know, they maybe hit another gold mine uh, as well, I'm not sure but um, sh- uh, I'm sure they're hoping, like, hopefully there's another Genshin Impact for us, and you know, who... who I can't blame them. Genshin Impact has made a shit ton of money, and they're hoping this makes a shit ton of money, too. <laughs> I'll try it out. I don't know. <laughs> the last news story on the list involves a game that we brought up a couple times on this podcast, uh, and that is a new DLC for Tales of Arise, and I guess this came out at the very end of the uh, Tokyo Game Show uh, from last week. We didn't cover it in the podcast. And that is, is that Tales of Arise is having a crossover with our favorite anime series, Sword Art Online, specifically with the uh, recent RPG, Sword Art Online, Alicization Licorice. So, Licorice, um, yeah. yeah. Licorice, Licorice. Um, yeah. So, Licorice. so basically both games are going to get a DLC featuring in a crossover stuff from the other. For the Sword Art Online Alicization game, it'll get a DLC a free DLC involving the costumes from Alfin and Shion from Tales of Arise. Uh, Tales of Arise, however, will get a little bit more. Um, the details here are a bit like nuanced. So I don't know if I should hand this off to Adam. Like they had, it has a free set that released already. Okay. In Japan. So th- there but is uh, for the for the for the Sao stuff. There is a boss battle against. So you can have like your Tales of Arise party take on Kirito and Asuna. Like they're actually in the game as a boss battle. And then once you do that, you get costumes for Alfin, Shion, and also Law um, that are basically based on Kirito or Asuna. And then there's also uh, there's also DLC um, for there's also DLC for new difficulty modes, 
like an, uh, there's like a super easy mode and a super hard mode. Those are free, I believe. Um, the weird thing about that update is that if you play on Steam, like on PC, it's just a free update, just like any Steam game. But if you play on consoles, I actually didn't look into this because I don't play the game on consoles too much, but um, you actually have to like enter like a giveaway on their website to get it. It's really weird. Um, <laughs> Uh, Let me look this up. Actually, you can you, you can see why I deferred this to Adam because I tried reading through like the press release and the new the news report, and I'm just like this. Why does this? Yeah, here's so what the press release says: Console players can sign up through the Bandai Namco Entertainment America's website to receive a free DLC voucher. And if you click this link here, it's like uh, you have to enter your contact info and select a platform. Oh, and I, I, thought, I was like, oh, what? <laughs> why don't you just make it a patch <laughs> i yeah. don't know but the um the uh the sword art online dlc uh oh you also do get a new mystic art which i, I for alpha and Chion, which is probably based on sao and you get new weapons as well the thing about this that i that kind of most stuck out to me is that the sao collaboration dlc is 16 dollars. that's a lot for a boss fight costume a weapon and I guess a mystic art like that's like I know it's not nothing and I would expect it to be paid but $16 you're kind of entering almost like expansion cost territory there you know that's a lot it's a lot but then again when you look at like the list of Arise's DLC and their price it's like well yeah <laughs> this is what they're doing <laughs> with the game they have a lot of DLC for that game music and cheats and whatnot and yep. so <laughs> they're really trying to fucking milk the cow with the rise so uh, that's what they're hoping for. Um, yeah, that's. I guess <laughs> they're, 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 like they're going to use Arise as like a, some sort of like a ga- main game to like have crossover DLC with. Like, like people are paying they, attention to this. Yeah, if they put that hack there, then I guess they're fucking paying. Then, if they're that's that, that's what they're going to use. So if the if their next crossover is with dot hack, then I'm buying it. Yes, because I'm stupid. Is there a reason to think it might be dot hack or just because of the publisher? Yes, yeah. RB leak. I mean, well, on slightly related, the dot hack remaster for the uh, Rico GU bit, which is like the second tetralogy, yeah, that came out for consoles a few years ago. It got a Switch rating a while back, so that's pretty concrete that it'll come to Switch, but nothing official yet. And we don't. So I mentioned that the date said October 7th for at least a part of it in Japan. Is it out here yet? Do you know, Adam? It, uh, probably. All right. So I think it is. And that covers us for news for this uh, week of the TetraCast. So a little bit shorter, not as much, but we were able to spend the time talking about Ender Lilies and uh, stretch a bit to talk about Metroid Dread. Um, we do have a few things that I anticipate we'll be talking about next week, including uh, Ito's game, Dungeon Encounters, will come out this week. We'll be talking about, or, yeah, so uh, I'm sure Adam will be talking about that and maybe more of us. Uh, a few other games that are coming out in October that we'll keep an eye on that we'll be talking about either next week or beyond. Uh, and other than that, we'll be talking about all the other releases and trying to wrap up our backlogs, at least in some respect, so that we're in a good place to start deliberating on our top 10 lists and our Game of the Year selections. So, as always, you can read the reviews that we've written up, uh, the RPGs of 2022 list, and all the other news on the site at RPGsite.net. Uh, we're on all the social media platforms, uh, Twitter, at RPG Site, search for RPG Site on YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram, and we'll be on all those. Uh, we do have a Discord link at the top of our home screen. So go uh, there if you want to talk about Tales of Arise or any of the other RPGs that you've been playing recently. Uh, but other than that, we will be back next week with another edition of the TetraCast. Until then, stay safe, take care. We'll talk to you next time.